Good afternoon. My name is Luis Barreto Xavier. I'm of Council and uh, Head of Knowledge Institute at Abreu de Fogados. And it's with great pleasure that I welcome all of you to this webinar. Abreu de Fogados Forward Sessions are online seminars on legal topics. We will now start today's session dedicated to the German Constitutional Court decision and the future of Europe. The judgment of the German Constitutional Court of the 5th of May has raised a number of very important and diverse questions. On one hand, uh, legal questions, of course, regarding European Union law and national constitutions, and dealing with issues of legitimacy, supremacy, competence, competences, and proportionality tests. The reasoning behind the court's decision has been put in question by many on legal grounds. On the other hand, the judgment poses problems of clashes between courts and administrative bodies, such as the European Central Bank and national central banks, and the difficulty of a sound dialogue between legal and economic reasonings. It also highlights the thin line separating the concepts of monetary, fiscal, and economic policies. But one should not forget the political and economic dimensions of uh, this crisis and the big elephant in the room is the current European Monetary Union equipped with the necessary tools to make it work smoothly in the context of asymmetries among member states and in times of financial crisis. So we are living in a, a historic moment facing the worst economic crisis since World War II. And the decision of the Karlsruhe Court adds question marks on the future of European Union law, of the Eurozone, and the European Union itself. To discuss these questions, we have today the privilege of counting with a very distinguished panel of speakers. Matthias Kuhn, professor at NYU uh, Berlin Social, Centers, Social Sciences Center and Humboldt University, is a well-known scholar specialized in global constitutionalism and also the legal structure of markets. Gonçalo Meda Ribeiro is judge at the Portuguese Constitutional Court and professor at Catholica Law School. He has done research on theory of both private and public law and constitutional law in times of crisis. Matei Aceto is the vice president of the Constitutional Court of Slovenia and professor at the University of Ljubljana. He specializes in European Union law fundamental rights and citizenship. We will begin this session with presentations by the three speakers. We'll have then time for discussion and Q&A with questions previously submitted during registration. Moderating the debate, we'll have Professor Luis Fabrica of Council at Abreu de Vogados with a significant academic and professional curriculum. He is a member of the Higher uh, Council of Administrative and Taxation Courts and has published extensively in the area of public law. Now it's time to give the, the floor to Professor Matthias Kuhn for his presentation. Matthias? Uh, you have to, to, to turn on your, the micro. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, as the first representer, given the topic, I think I should probably uh, focus on some uh, basic points that concern the um, uh, case uh, and its reasoning um, uh, um, before then uh, going into an assessment as to uh, what the implications are uh, and uh, both in legal terms and in practical operational economic terms. Uh, so first uh, to the core uh, judgment. This judgment was the first time that uh, the German Constitutional Court uh, held acts, uh, an act of the European Union, here very concretely a specific program um, conducted by the ECB, the Public Sector Purchasing Program, um, to be ultra virus, to be enacted beyond the competencies uh, that are the EU. So the claim is the EU did something that legally it was not, uh, did not have the authority to do because it lacked competencies. Um, 
It's the first time a German court has said this because the obvious puzzle is what the role of national courts should be to make this type of a judgment. Uh, the, because of course, in the, as a matter of European Union law, uh, the question whether a particular organ of the EU has, an act, has acted outside of its competencies is something that can be challenged and ulti is ultimately decided by the European Court of Justice. Uh, and in this case too, uh, when the case came up through the German system, the German Constitutional Court did what a good uh, national court in Europe does. It made a preliminary reference to the European Court of Justice, um, uh, uh, which then uh, decided that the acts of the central bank were within the competencies of the European Union. And then the German court uh, receiving back this reference looked at the judgment uh, and concluded um, that, uh, and this was the relevant standard it had to use under German constitutional law to come to its conclusion. It determined that the actions of the European Central Bank uh, and the judgment of the, Europe, of the Court of Justice of the European Union were both arbitrary in its claims with regard to uh, competencies. And this, they claimed, would lead to a structural shift of the competencies um, and as such could not be binding on Germany. So that was the core claim. Now, how does this become a constitutional claim? How does an issue that to begin with sounds very much like an EU competencies issues, issue, how does that become a German constitutional issue? And in particular, and, more, uh, and particularly intriguing, is how does this become a fundamental rights issue? Because this is what it was. Uh, this is how it came up in the German context. So these, what we had here were individual citizens in, 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 their individual, in the capacity as individual citizens bringing a claim um, uh, before a German court claiming that their right to, to an equal, their, their equal right to vote uh, was violated. Um, and so this is, that's the rights basis, that's the rights foundation of this. So how, so the question is right away, what's the link between the claim of a right to participate in elections on an equal, to equal terms, what does that have to do uh, with competencies and the limits of competencies of the European Union? So this is a, here the court draws uh, on a long line of cases, uh, beginning with the Maastricht decision, and then through the Lisbon decision, Honeywell decision, a whole range of cases where it established a doctrinal framework that constructs a link between an individual right to vote uh, and these types of issues of European Union law. And its basic claim is the following. Basically, um, the right to vote in a genuine democracy means that um, uh, um, that you have a right to uh, have a say in all relevant questions of uh, government. Um, and to the extent that the democratic legislature delegates authority somewhere else, for example, by signing and ratifying a, a treaty on the European Union, uh, then it can do that within certain limits. Uh, but when it does so, these other new authorities that are created by a new treaty regime are authorized to act in a way that is valid in Germany only if and to the extent that they act within um, the framework of the treaty which grounds the authority uh, of these uh, institutions um, uh, in German law. So that's, the, so that's the link between the individual right to vote and the limits of the... So when you have an, an actor of the EU acting ultra vires, then if it is true that this is an act that is no longer covered by the bridge between the national and the European, the law um, signed and ratified in Germany, which uh, the, the treaty, the, the, the ratification of the treaty, once that link is, is broken uh, because there's an organ on the EU level that acted ultra virus, then the court claims uh, it, has, it can establish certain limits. Now, what is important to understand, to, that's the only thing I will say in defense of the court, um, is that the court is very careful um, uh, in its reflection on the systemic consequences uh, of its judgment and of its striking down an act of EU law on the grounds um, that uh, it's, it was enacted ultra virus. It, the court is very specific in saying that it's not the role of national courts generally to review the European Court of Justice on issues of EU law. 
generally speaking, they just accept the result, even if in substance they disagree with it. It's only in what the court says are extreme and rare cases when, uh, from its perspective, um, the EU uh, decisions are arbitrary in the sense that there is no plausible methodological uh, construction uh, of that result, uh, that it will uh, then come to the conclusion that this cannot stand, at least domestically, uh, for domestic institutions when applying EU law. So that's another important point. The German Constitutional Court does not claim that EU law is invalid as a matter of EU law. It doesn't have the authority to pronounce itself on that. It's merely saying that EU law can't be binding on German organs um, uh, that would otherwise be involved in the implementation uh, of these acts. So very concretely, if we're dealing with an act by the European Central Bank, the implementation of the uh, public sector purchasing program, then it would mean that the German Central Bank, as part of the framework of the European Central Bank, couldn't uh, play, couldn't implement, uh, couldn't, couldn't do its part to implement uh, the program. So here comes now an important uh, operational, further important operational qualification for this case. The court did not say categorically that uh, Germany could not implement, or that the European cent that the German Central Bank could play no role in implementing the public sector purchasing program. Uh, what it did say is that the acts were ultra vires unless um, uh, um, it could be uh, the European institution, so the European Central Bank, would within three months uh, provide um, a justification. Uh, for, um, for its program showing that it is proportionate. So one of the reasons, the core reason why the court claimed uh, the, the ECB was acting ultra vires was that even though what the ECB was doing, its program was, was the court ultimately said, did further a legitimate purpose. It could be understood as, as so the European Central Bank could be understood as trying to um, fulfill its mandate to secure, um, um, uh, to follow the relevant monetary policy, keeping inflation at roughly 2%. Um, one could understand the measures uh, in that way. So in that sense, um, these measures further a legitimate purpose, um, but they are disproportionate, so the court suggests, because of the significant economic and financial consequences uh, connected to them. So the monetary effects, the furthering the legitimate purpose uh, is, so the court suggests, um, is likely to be uh, relatively insignificant when compared to the uh, very significant financial and economic impacts. And if those financial and economic impacts uh, is really a, a, a disproportionately significant when compared to the monetary uh, goal, then the court claims uh, this is uh, this is disproportionate and as such doesn't fall under the competencies of the ECB. So um, the court then says the EC, that the reason why it could say that the actions were ultra vires is not that the court disagrees with the assessment made by the ECB or the uh, Court of Justice of the European Union about proportionality. So it's not that uh, all these institutions engage in a proportionality contest and the German court just believes that the result should be a different one. The core reason why the German court was confident uh, to call the court of justice arbitrary in its actions and the ECB too in this regard is that they failed to engage in such a test properly. So the claim is that in particularly the balancing between the monetary goals and the economic and fiscal implications of this program, uh, which are very significant. Um, so there was nothing that the central bank provided and nothing that the European Court of Justice provided um, that took account of any of that. And the failure of taking account of any of that uh, grounded ultimately the claim uh, that this was uh, obviously uh, and objectively arbitrary and would thus uh, not be binding uh, in Germany. But uh, if the European Central, uh, if uh, the central bank uh, was to provide an account of what it was doing that showed that it was proportionate within three months, then the problems would go away. So um, the real, so in, practic in practical terms, 
um, uh, this decision, I think, ultimately is not, um, uh, uh, is with regard to the specific issue it's deciding, is not of uh, great significance. All it needs is the European Central Bank to uh, somebody there to provide a, a paper that analyzes the economic and financial consequences and then determines that notwithstanding these consequences, uh, overall, all things considered, this is proportionate. Um, and then ideally the European, the German central bank would nod its head and say, indeed it is. Um, and then this would be off the table and there, and, the, and, and, and it would no longer be in violation of German constitutional law as determined by the German constitutional court if the German central bank implemented uh, the relevant program. So we just, what the, the, the real issue right now in practical terms, with regard to just this concrete issue, uh, is how can the, Euro the European Central Bank, without losing face, uh, produce uh, this kind of proportionality analysis? Because it could not possibly simply respond to the German Constitutional Court. It would be, I think, it would be inadequate if it did, uh, because it would, and if it did, it would, in some sense, validate uh, the role that the German Constitutional Court is playing. And it was already for that reason that the, that the European Central Bank, I think correctly, refused to participate in the proceedings. There were, uh, there were oral proceedings uh, in which the Central Bank was invited um, uh, and it refused to join. Uh, and for obvious reasons, it doesn't want to validate um, uh, the process. It claims, uh, as a European institution, you would rightly claim that this is not, you know, if you're seeking information generally, well, maybe we'll provide that. But if you are asking us to participate in, an, in a procedure that claims to be authoritative, that which reviews our competencies, that's none of your business. So we're not going to participate in a process which validates that. So the, so the question is, given that that's the kind of that's the political backdrop here, uh, the question is, how can the European Central Bank, without losing face, uh, somehow produce the relevant uh, paper? Um, uh, uh, that the German Central Bank will then sign off on for the German side um, and thereby remove the crisis, the potential uh, crisis. But that can be done. I mean, that, there are different ways that this can be done. We can imagine um, the representative, the German representative on the European Central Bank board to uh, draft a paper, um, 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 which then uh, will be noted uh, by the rest of the council uh, if they take note of it uh, approvingly. Uh, and then that, then basically the, the German Central Bank would have produced it for itself. Uh, so there are ways of dealing with this. So frankly, I believe the practical implications of this judgment with regard to the case that was at issue uh, is not going to be very significant. Of course, the question is, um, is there anything about this judgment which is otherwise of greater systemic uh, relevance? And it might be so uh, for two reasons. One of them is that the, the framework it established uh, and the kind of obiter dictum, it, uh, obiter dicta it included, would preclude the European Central Bank from doing a wide range of other things um, that it's already engaged on, that it might be now engaging in in the context of the, of the corona crisis. Um, but there, you know, there have been uh, some who said that, um, in fact, there is a straitjacket that the Constitutional Court has designed, which makes it very difficult for some of these programs uh, to pass muster. Uh, but frankly, uh, I think the way these, these things will play uh, practically uh, is that this very specific details and arguments that you find in this more than 130 page um, uh, document, this decision by the court, uh, won't have a significant precedential uh, value. Uh, and I doubt, um, 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 and I doubt that in that, in that way, uh, the judgment will have great implications for reviewing uh, ECB's actions in the future. However, another implication uh, the judgment may have is a general systemic one with regard to the relationship between national courts and uh, the European Union. So could it be that the court is setting an awful precedent uh, that undermines the authority, the primacy of, uh, of EU law uh, more generally? I mean, and here, the, here the, the fear is, of course, that if the German constitutional court can go up and say to the Court of Justice of the European Union and all EU organs, you acted obviously arbitrarily. 
Uh, isn't that an invitation uh, for the Hungarian or the Polish uh, court to have the confidence to do the same? And then when they're being called out and says, well, you're just a rogue state that's, uh, that's resisting the authority of the EU illicitly, then you shrug your shoulders and say, no, actually, we're just kind of taking the same approach as the German constitutional court. Uh, so there's a way in which this, there's a fear that this might um, set a precedent. Um, uh, which, which will have the tendency to erode the authority, uh, the primacy of EU law, uh, and the authority of EU institutions, not just before other courts. And of that, for that, I'd like to hear what Matej Akšeto le later on has to say uh, about what, how, this, how he believes that this might be received by other apex courts uh, within the European Union. But this isn't just about courts. It's also about how political governments um, uh, uh, relate to EU institutions and the authority of the EU when they make demands on them, say with regard to democratic reforms or the independence of the judiciary or anything uh, like that. So that's, that's, that's an, an important topic. I think others will have to, uh, something to say on. I won't now uh, say uh, anything uh, further about that, except for one thing. We have to note that even though this is the first time that the German Constitutional Court has actually declared actions to, by the EU to be ultra vires, the threat that it might do so, so the doctrinal structure establishing its claim to authority that it can do so, uh, is old. It goes back to the Maastricht decision. And there have been a number of previous decisions uh, where the court invoked the same doctrinal framework. So but the basic doctrine that the court used to do what it's doing here is not new. It's established doctrine. It's, there's, nothing, there's nothing new uh, about the basic structure of the way that the court approaches the European court, the, the European Union institutions uh, here. So that's something to keep in mind. And secondly, one also has to keep in mind the German court is not the first court to have declared acts of the EU uh, ultra virus. Uh, there have been uh, decisions of that kind uh, by the Danish uh, Supreme Court and by the Czech um, Constitutional Court. Um, um, though in those cases it was they concern much more parochial, specific, limited issues, uh, and not such major issues uh, as uh, the general political programs, fundamental central programs uh, of the European Central Bank. Um, okay, so with other words, um, um, uh, I, I'm. For reasons, I won't, if, if I get asked later on, I'll be very happy to say why I think exactly, what exactly I think is wrong with the German Constitution Court's decision. I think it's fundamentally flawed, but I won't go into the questions as to why here now, because my time uh, is up. Uh, but even though I do think this is a very unhelpful and fundamentally flawed decision, I actually don't think its implications are as great and as significant as some people uh, make out. Thank you. So thank, thank you very much, uh, Matthias. Now um, I, I pass the floor to uh, Professor Gonzalo Ahmed uh, You have to connect your micro. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Luis. It's, uh, I'm thrilled to be here, um, especially because I'm in the company and discussing with uh, two individuals um, with whom I'm connected by strong ties of intellectual complicity and personal affection. And of course, that's Matthias Kuhn and Matej Aceto. Uh, so it's a very great pleasure, um, pleasure. I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. I'm going to make four remarks about these long and complex judgments. Um, the first remark has to do with the primacy of EU law. The second remark um, has to do with the idea of an ultra virus control uh, performed by domestic constitutional courts or Supreme Courts. The third idea has to do with the proportionality test demanded by and deployed by the German Constitutional Court. And finally, if there is time, I'll talk a little bit about from a strictly legal and constitutional standpoint, what the implications or consequences of this judgment might be. Uh, so without further ado, the first remark, uh, which has to do with the primacy of EU law. And I think it would be useful to think about um, a, a hypothetical in the United States where we could think how this whole drama would play out. So imagine that uh, for instance, the Supreme Court of some state, Montana or Wyoming, ordered some state agency not to enforce a regulation of uh, some federal agency, imagine the Environmental Protection Agency or 
uh, one of those on either the grounds that it exceeded the powers of the EPA as provided for in federal congressional legislation or that it violated some provision in the constitution of the state. Now, if this happened in the federal structure of the United States, there are three possibilities in an ascending scale of drama. First, the decision of the Supreme Court of the state, say Montana, could be reviewed by federal courts, including, of course, the Supreme Court of the United States. Secondly, the Supreme Court of the United States could review the compatibility of, say, a provision in the state constitution with federal uh, law, including, of course, the United States Constitution, but also federal legislation and even federal regulations. And, and thirdly, so all of this is possible, and let's imagine that the United States Supreme Court were to say that what is at stake is the unity of the uh, legal order and federal law trumps unqualifiedly um, state law, and thereby I am ordering um, state agencies to comply with federal legislation. And let's imagine um, an absurd but not um, impossible scenario in which the relevant fed, uh, state institutions refuse to um, respect the judgment of the Supreme Court. And there's a precedent in 1957, nine students were barred from entering a high school in Little Rock, Arkansas, which had just been set, desegregated um, in the wake of Brown versus Board of Education. And the um, governor of Arkansas ordered the National Guard of Arkansas to prevent these students from entering the high school. And what happened was that President Eisenhower federalized the National Guard of Arkansas and sent the 101st Airborne Division of the United States Army to Little Rock, Arkansas to enforce Brown versus Board of Education. None of this is possible um, in the European Union. The European Court of Justice has no power to review decisions by domestic courts. Uh, the European Court of Justice has no power to strike down uh, domestic legislation or decisions. And obviously, uh, Frau von der Leyen cannot send the 101st Airborne Division of the EU Army to any state, including now Berlin, because there is no such thing as the European Union. So to begin with, the European Union legal order is not a classical federal legal order, whatever it is. It is something very different. And the primacy of EU law depends to a very large extent on the active cooperation of domestic judiciaries, including, of course, the constitutional courts of the member states. This is the institutional aspect. So the, the, the European Court of Justice um, has no supremacy over domestic courts in general, but particularly domestic constitutional courts. Then there is the issue of substance, and the issue of substance is the following. Uh, it's undoubtedly the case that the European Union depends on the uniform application, interpretation and application of its law across the Union that is in each of the member states. And the European Court of Justice has a crucial role to play in that. That's the very reason for its existence. But that doesn't mean that EU law may um, take unqualified or absolute precedence or primacy over domestic law, and here is why. Because in the kinds of regimes under which we live, which we call liberal or constitutional democracies, any claim to authority, um, including authority to build and maintain a common market and a common currency, has to respect certain fundamental constitutional conditions, uh, which come essentially under three main headings. Heading number one, respect for fundamental rights. Heading number two, respect for basic principles of the rule of law, say, um, no crime without prior uh, statute, no penalty without prior statute, um, the principle of legality of executive action, so on and so forth. And third, that laws and decisions are generated by democratic procedures of decision making. So these are the three basic conditions that we call constitutionalism and which constrain and shape the kinds of regimes under which we live. Um, so in and a much older judgment in the 1980s, if I'm not mistaken, in 1986, the German Constitutional Court famously, this is the so-called Zolange II judgment, said, um, we are willing to recognize the primacy or precedence of EU law, but only under the condition that the European Court of Justice 
make sure that EU law respects or is in keeping with fundamental rights. Um, and this case law of the uh, German Constitutional Court has developed over time and has made it possible for the European Court of Justice to perform um, e at, at this moment in history a role that is in many respects similar to that which a constitutional court would ordinarily play when it exercises the power of judicial review of legislation. Um, this is what the German constitutional court has, has calls now since the famous 2009 judgment on the Lisbon Treaty, identity control. So it says that for, um, the, for EU law um, to be applied in Germany, it must respect the constitutional identity of Germany. And that is essentially fundamental rights, rule of law, and uh, the principle of democracy or democratic legitimation. Now, this idea of constitutional identity is a complex idea that may be cashed out in different ways. And one particularly helpful way of understanding it is to think of it as a spectrum in which you can have at one end a strictly universalist account of constitutional identity and at the other end of the spectrum you have a particularist account of constitutional identity. So at the universalist end you would say fundamental rights, rule of law and democracy mean exactly the same thing in Berlin as they do in Lisbon and Ljubljana and in Brussels. And so there is no reason in principle for the European Court of Justice not to be able to perform this role as a surrogate for domestic constitutional courts. And if it does so, then the um, uniform interpretation and application of EU law is secured and thereby we can have a common market and a common currency and so on and so forth. At the other end of the spectrum, we have a very different idea. The idea is that um, the fundamental rights protected by the German constitution or the constitution of Slovenia, uh, Slovenia or Portugal and the rule of law is understood in each of these countries and democracy as we understand it varies, it's different, and thereby constitutional courts have an active role in protecting these particular values that are constitutive of their domestic legal orders and are conditions of legitimacy of any acts of public authority that play a role or have an effect in their territory. And in between these two, when these two, um, um, these two extremes of the spectrum, you can have a number of intermediate positions. It's fair to say that the German Constitutional Court, since its Zolange II judgment in the 1980s, has evolved in what I would describe as a markedly particularistic fashion. If you look, if you compare that judgment, say, with a 2015 judgment on the European arrest warrant, you would see that the uh, German Constitutional Court takes a more particularistic view. But it's hard to label, and we would need a much bigger sample of opinions in order to figure this out. Um, most constitutional courts would be, as a matter of fact, somewhere between the liberal cosmopolitan universalist Kantian extreme at one end of the spectrum and the romantic historicist particularist Volksgeisty um, end of the spectrum. Um, what I want to say very clearly is this. Um, this is not something to worry about. This is something that is only natural given the structure of the European Union, not being a federal state. Of course, we have to expect that at the very least, the messy constitutional courts as guardians of the constitutional order play an active role in policing uh, whether the, Europe, the, the law that proceeds from European institutions is in keeping with these basic conditions of legitimate authority. So that is my first point, and it's broadly sympathetic to the German Federal Constitutional Court. It's only the case that what the German court did on this occasion has not much to do with that. It has not much to do with what it calls identity control. It has to do with something that it calls ultra-virus control. Now, there is a link between these two. Um, the German court suggests often, at least as I understand it, that the foundations for the ultra-virus control uh, lie with the constitutional identity of Germany. Uh, but it's only indirectly a constitutional issue. It's directly an issue of EU law. And the question is whether the European Central Bank, in this case, um, through these decisions which embody the PSPP policy, the public sector asset purchase policy, is acting within the competences that are ascribed to it by EU primary law that is by the treaties. 
And the German constitutional court has an extremely elaborate argument for the view that it should exercise its ultra-virus control. As Matthias said, and this is important, the court says we only step in, given that ordinarily this is a task for the ECJ, um, in extreme circumstances, uh, which I will describe later. Um, we, we will only do it as a measure of last resort, but we will do it. And the reason why we do it is the following, because um, the power that the European Union has, that the institutions and organs of the European Union have, they have it on the basis of treaties which embody the united will of the states. The states have chosen at their discretion to transfer certain powers to the European Union for purposes that they believe to be important enough to justify um, that um, sacrifice of their sovereignty. And their will is embodied in the treaties and they remain masters of the treaties. And thereby, because this is a principal agent relationship in which the EU is an agent with a mandate that is conferred upon it by the states, we cannot as a constitutional court acting as the conscience of the German legal order alienate our role of last resort to make sure that the creature remains within the bounds set by it by its very creator, that being of course the states as masters of the treaties. And thereby, says the German court, if we allow the ECJ to have the last word on issues of competence, we would be de facto giving the ECJ the power to write new competences or powers into EU, EU primary law. And this would be a violation of the principle of conferral, which in turn would violate the democratic principle that lies at the core of uh, the German constitutional order because it would alienate the German people from a say on matters in which they wanted not the European Union but themselves to have a say. Um, it's a pretty elaborate argument and the court has been very consistent in the reiteration of this argument. And I would like to say, I, I promise that I'll be much briefer on the other two remarks I want to make. I, I want to say that it's, it's um, an apparently impressive argument but in my view, and I'm I'm pretty sure Matthias agrees with me, and I'm not sure about Mate, but I would be surprised if he doesn't agree as well. Um, it's a flawed argument. Um, if I were not here in my capacity, also as a judge of the Constitutional Court of Portugal, but strictly as a legal scholar, I would be tempted to say that if you scratch the surface, it's a pretty terrible argument. But I'll just stick to saying that it's a flawed argument. And here is why, because the argument is self-defeating. The argument is based on this idea that if you're an agent, um, you cannot have the authority to decide on your own authority. That remains the prerogative of your principle. But it just turns out that this argument, and, and I want to be clear that, as Matthias said, what the German constitutional court says is that we're only going to intervene if the judgment of the European Court of Justice is, and these are the words that the court uses, simply incomprehensible or objectively arbitrary. Um, and I find this standard to be um, a pretty aggressive one, borderline insulting for a court, because of course courts, um, the legitimacy of judicial decisions is to a large extent based on the reasons they publicly offer for their decisions. So to say of a court like the ECJ, that it may be the case sometimes, and this was definitely what the German court understood to be the case this one time, that the ECJ is able to write dozens of pages of text which do not embody comprehensible reasons or that is objectively arbitrary is a pretty harsh thing to say about another um, superior court. But in any case, um, going beyond that point, uh, here's the problem. The problem is that the argument is self-defeating because you see the authority of the German constitutional court on the basis of this constitutional theory is itself delegated. The constitutional court, when like all German courts, when it drafts an opinion and rules on an issue, it does so in the name of the people and thereby it's acting as an agent of its principle, its principle being the German people, which expressed it with its will through the exercise of pouvoir constituant, uh, the outcome of which is the German constitution. So under this view of the German constitutional court, um, it would be, um, if you universalize this view, which is a test to its consistency and principled character, you would have to consider that on some occasions, some German citizen may say, I respect as a general matter the judgments of the constitutional court, except when they are simply incomprehensible and objectively arbitrary, meaning in my assessment, simply incomprehensible and objectively arbitrary. And then as a member of the people, which is the principle to which the German constitutional court is bound, I refuse to give my assent 
um, to these decisions. I am pretty sure the German Constitutional Court doesn't accept that. It claims ultimate authority to decide what the German Constitution means um, and does not mean. Um, of course, you may tell me at this point, this is an unfair argument because a German court would say so if it were pressed to produce an argument. It would say so on the basis of a series of reasons to claim ultimate authority. First, it would say, look, unlike a lay person that you may find on the street, we are actually trained to interpret the constitution. So we have expertise in this field, and this you may call an epistemic argument that favors the court's ultimate authority. And then you can say, apart from that, we have um, legitimacy because the German constitutional court is staffed by judges that have been appointed by other relevant constitutional institutions and they are as a whole representative of pluralism across society. And you see people, it's not a lone individual on the street is the German people as a whole. So we are a better, better proxy for that principle than some random individual that you may find. And thirdly, they would say, apart from that, um, it turns out that um, we decide cases on the basis of a procedure which includes many safeguards and make sure that we are not judges in our own cause. There are elaborate rules of recusal and this and that, and thereby procedural fairness is secured when it comes to decisions by the constitutional court, not if there is a passionate individual that is angry about something and might have a different opinion, which is very much based on his or her own interests. Now, all of this is true, but now let's apply these reasons in the comparison between the German Constitutional Court and the ECJ. Um, which of these courts is likely to be um, presumably more of an expert in the interpretation of EU law? Because you see, when it comes to ultra-virus, this is not about interpreting the German Constitution, it's about interpreting the treaties. Now, of course, um, I, I know for a fact that there are some constitutional judges who are much better EU lawyers than I suppose many of the EU lawyers sitting in the uh, ECJ. For example, Matei um, is, I know this for a fact, is an outstanding EU lawyer. But the point is there is no reason to believe in general that being a constitutional judge gives you any particular expertise to be good at figuring out what the treaties mean. Whereas if you're a judge of the European Court of Justice, even if you were appointed without knowing much of EU law, the job will press you to become a pretty good EU lawyer. So the expertise argument or the epistemic argument doesn't really work in favor of this ultra-virus control. Now we move to the second argument, which I think is even more clear. So the legitimacy argument. Again, the German constitutional court may be an excellent proxy for Germany, for the German people, but it's not an excellent proxy for the principle that according to this construction, these theories at stake here, because that principle is a collective entity. It's the whole of the states. They are together the, master of the, treat, the masters of the treaties, not any particular member state. And those are the states that appoint the judges of the European Court of Justice. So the European Court of Justice is much better proxy for the principle that is relevant for these purposes according to this theory than any domestic constitutional court. And then we come to the third argument, the argument of procedural fairness. But in both cases, we have independent courts. And even though um, sometimes you may read a, a subtext in judgments of domestic constitutional courts that the ECJ may be biased against the um, authority of, and the contents of the member states and in favor of um, enlarging the scope of competence of the European Union. This argument cuts both ways. You can make very well the same argument that the messy constitutional courts have the opposite bias. So I don't really see any solid reason for the messy constitutional courts to perform an ultra-virus control as opposed to what the German court calls an identity control. However, you cash out the complicated or unpack the complicated idea of um, an ultra-virus control. And this, and then I'll move to my third remark and I'll be much briefer because here's the point. The German constitutional court has been, um, has established and developed the idea of ultra-virus control now for about a quarter of a century since its 93 Maastricht decision. And so this is pretty much settled case law. Now I've argued against that premise, but if you take that, that premise as established and this decision of the German constitutional court is neither particularly surprising nor, um, simply incomprehensible, objectively arbitrary, or completely unreasonable by any measure of the imagination. I do think I would dissent if I had to vote on this case, but I think it's a perfectly reasonable decision. What the German Constitutional Court 
um, did, by the way, and, and I think there's a fair amount of confusion about this. It did not say that the, um, um, uh, the ESPP program is a bad idea. It did not say that it lacks merit, that it's a bad monetary policy. It did not say that if you weigh the costs and benefits of this policy, you should reach the conclusion that it is disproportionate, or at least we want European Central Bank to do that assessment and the European Court of Justice to review that assessment and we'll be here to be reviewers of last resort. It didn't say anything like that. What it said was that the union has exclusive competence in matters of monetary policy and that policy and that competence is primarily ascribed to the uh, European Central Bank, but the states retain competence in fiscal and economic matters for the most part. And these policies, uh, quantitative easing, and particularly this program, the ESPP, these are policies that pursue monetary effects, perhaps, because it's fair to say the court is suspicious that that is actually the primary goal, it's certainly the official goal, but they have very substantial, as Matthias said, um, economic and fiscal effects. And what the court says is that, when that is the case, when in the use of a competence, an European institution encroaches upon a competence that is retained by the member states, you need to conduct a proportionality analysis. You need to see if the use of that competence is suitable, it's necessary, and all things considered, it's justified or balanced, considering that it sacrifices some of the autonomy or competence of the member states. And what the court said was that, in this case, um, no such proportionality assessment was conducted, uh, or at least it wasn't conducted in the way in which we think would be methodologically sound. And that's why we conclude it is ultra-virus, not because it is disproportionate, we can't really tell, but because it wasn't really subject to any proportionality test in the first place. Um, I'm not going to explain myself, but I'll say I have three objections against these arguments, and I'll be very brief, I'll just state them. I'm very skeptical that it makes sense to extend the proportionality principle as it is conceived when we are balancing conflicting interests and rights to the field of powers and competences, at least in the straightforward fashion in which the German Constitutional Court demands that EU institutions and then the ECJ do. So that's the first aspect. So I am critical of what the German court takes to be the only methodologically sound way of resolving these issues. My second objection is that even if you take that for granted, I find it um, very difficult to establish the premise for that proportionality assessment, uh, which the court recognizes as a fundamental premise. And that is that you need to clearly distinguish between the monetary and the economic and fiscal effects of a policy or decisions that are undertaken by a central bank. Um, this is a matter of great controversy among economies, and I, I think it's not reasonable to think that you can discriminate in any clear fashion between one type of effect and the other, which is different from saying that you can discriminate between different types of action. For example, a central bank has no power to raise taxes, which is a fiscal policy, or to decide where entities should spend their money, which is an obvious budgetary power. But when it is uh, using powers that are typical of monetary policy makers, it's extremely difficult to distinguish, if, if, if it even makes sense, to distinguish what is monetary and what is economic and fiscal. And my final objection is that even if you think that is possible, I do not agree uh, with the constitutional court's idea that because this is an issue of competence, courts need to exert strict scrutiny over the assessment that is made by the decision-making institution, in, in this case, the European Central Bank. I think that there is no reason to believe that even when the issue is one of competence, but when the issue of competence is so deeply intertwined with the issue of substance, that judges are particularly well equipped to simply second guess the assessment that is made by other institutions, especially in light of the fact that, and, and here I really disagree, I think the fact that the European Central Bank is an independent institution, ironically in many ways with the same kind of legitimacy that we ascribe to constitutional courts themselves, is some sort of capitis de minutio, which justifies stricter scrutiny on the part of judicial institutions, uh, including the ECJ and then the constitutional court. And this leads me to my final point, I'll be extremely brief about the consequences from a strictly legal standpoint. So Matthias said, I don't believe this will have any precedential value. If that's the case, then 
Of course, this will be just an isolated opinion which will have no influence in the future development of the case law of the German Constitutional Court. But if we do take this opinion, which is very consistent with the prior case law of the German Constitutional Court, then I think that from a legal and constitutional standpoint, it creates a big problem. And, and here is why. Because what the court is saying in substance, in substance, is that the European Central Bank cannot perform the kind of role that we expect central banks to perform in um, the federal structures or nation states. It cannot act as the Fed. Um, its competences are much narrower. And it's arguably the case that you cannot have a common currency unless you have a pretty strong central bank. So the alternative to this would be to say, okay, so now the states need to get together and amend the treaties and they will give these powers to the European Central Bank. But here's the problem. That solves the ultra virus issue, but then it triggers the different issue of identity control because since 2009, it's a massive ruling on the Lisbon Treaty. The German Constitutional Court said that budgetary and fiscal autonomy is part of the very core of sovereignty. So if German institutions say the Bundestag were to transfer that to the European Union, they would alienate the German people from its capacity of democratic self-determination and this would be a violation of the constitutional identity of Germany. So it's not clear at all that there is room for this power to be explicitly given to the European Central Bank. So that leaves us with what? I only see three scenarios. Scenario number one, uh, the European Union becomes a federal state. And of course, this is unthinkable. Uh, whatever our views on that, um, it's obviously politically unthinkable. So that's pretty much off the table. Uh, scenario number two, you could say, well, there's something else. Some people suggest that what we should have is a proper EU budget in which the EU would, for example, tax the wealth that the common market generates and that would have a much bigger budget and this would give, us, give it some measure of fiscal autonomy. Um, but not only is this in the current political context very unlikely to happen, but it's also the case that even that is hardly compatible with the understanding that the German Constitutional Court has of the identity, the constitutional identity of Germany, because you see, that would mean that the European Union would have indeed vast authority in fiscal and budgetary manners, and its authority would have obvious spillover effects over the uh, conduction by the member states of their own fiscal and budgetary policy. So it's not clear that that would be permissible given the understanding that the uh, Federal Constitutional Court has of the constitutional identity of Germany. And that leaves us a third scenario, which is that um, Germany cannot participate in the common currency, which would be the end of the common currency. And this is obviously not intended um, in this decision, um, and it's a very it's very far from what is said in this opinion. But if you scratch the surface and if you put this opinion together with a vast body of impressive case law the Constitutional Court has on um, issues of European integration, um, it's not so absurd to say that the court has, to use Matthias's metaphor has built for itself and for Germany and the European Union ultimately a straitjacket and it's going to be very difficult to get out of that straitjacket because um, it's either going to be the case that the court will backpedal and will detract from half a century of case law which have pushed things in such a way that the only option that might be left on the table is for the common currency to no longer be or it will have to be um, the case that for Germany to participate in the common currency and for the common currency to be, including for the European Central Bank to play an indispensable role in the management of the, the common currency, you would need to disrespect a judgment of the Federal Constitutional Court. And that, that of course, would mean that uh, the rule of law would uh, be thrown out of the window. Um, it's, a, it's a very complicated dilemma. Um, of course, there are all sorts of, um, this is from a strictly legal constitutional standpoint. There are all sorts of political maneuvers uh, that might avoid this. But those political maneuvers are problematic as well because we can drag a situation like that for many years. You would have the same thing in substance and call it different names. You revoke these decisions and you have other decisions that are essentially the same stuff in different packages. 
But the point is, imagine this would happen in a member state, that you would have a court striking down a piece of legislation and the next day, parliament will enact the very same substance um, in a different form and you would drag this for years and years and years. And of course, this would make it very hard to believe that these institutions are functioning in accordance with um, the rule of law. And so I think there is a limit also to how uh, political creativity may uh, allow the European Union, Germany, and the court itself to circumvent this big straitjacket that it has built for itself. And on this um, dark, depressing, and gloomy note, perhaps I put an end to my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Gonzalo. And now I give the floor to Professor Mattia Seto. Thank you very much, Luis. Uh, good afternoon from the other side or one of the other sides of Europe. Um, I'm very happy to be here, although I'm like my predecessor, my dear friend, Judge Gonzalo Almeida Ribeiro, at a bit of a quandary because I'm also, as you mentioned, a judge at the Constitutional Court. So I will try to assume the mantle of a professor of law um, and, and perhaps manage to, in a way, um, carefully speak without treading on the toes of my judicial brethren in Germany. Um, perhaps a better person to talk about this case would be the former president of the court, Andreas Foskule. If I understand correctly, he resigned, his, he, well, his term expired one day after having delivered this judgment of the German court. I read one commentary that said this gives a new meaning to going out with a bang, right? Because it was definitely a bang. It was a bang, like you mentioned before, like I think Matthias mentioned before, not because nobody would ever have done it. The Czech court did it with the Lantova ruling very clearly. They said this is a ultra virus uh, instance. The Danish court did it slightly less expressly with the Dansk industry address case. Uh, but now it's the Germans doing it, and, and we've always become accustomed to the fact that when the German court does something, it, it instantly reverberates more. I think, and I remember this from the Lisbon Treaty, and it may have been the case always before, but with the Lisbon Treaty, I was quite aware of that. Um, it's not, I think it's notable for a European court um, to be aware of its significance for the European debate when the, the same day the decision is handed down in German and in the English translation already available on the, on the website. I, I think you know, that in itself shows you the awareness of the significance of the German court saying something like that and, and issuing a judgment like that. Um, it's also telling that it was the first time, I think, I don't remember it happening with the Danish case and the Czech case that the Court of Justice actually responded with a brief press release. Um, it was a very brief press release, quite restrained as judicial press releases would tend to be, notwithstanding the fact that, of course, the, the press, I, I think the first time I, I saw notice of it was when I read a news item saying the ECJ slams the German courts. And I said, what slamming has been going on. And of course, it's some terse reminders that the ultimate arbiter on the interpretation of EU law should be the European Court of Justice and so forth. Nothing much than that. Um, but that, 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 that in itself, I think, is a telling sort of message of significance for this debate. And although I agree with Matthias, I think the repercussions might not be as severe as right now the doomsday commentator, some of those uh, critiques might, might, might um, foretell it nevertheless will inevitably be significant just as all the other previous decisions of the German court still reverberate. I think the students of EU law in 10 years time, if they still study EU law, will definitely be studying that decision as well. Just like, and I think Gonzalo mentioned the Zolange, the Zolange saga, of course the 86 Zolange 2 was the continuation of the 74 Zolange 1, which actually was a more, was a more radical challenge. I think uh, when 86 Solange Zwei came down, people said, well, it's, uh, it's a step back. We're sort of relieved because the Germans say we're not going to exercise our control as long as generally the protection given by the Court of Justice um, and EU law in general through that is substantially similar to the German protection of fundamental rights. I think in 74 they were even more um, extreme. The big point is that 
similar challenges have been taking place all throughout the European Union and the member states, but, but of course we are more aware of the German um, expression of that challenge. Um, now, I think it was mentioned before, and I would just like to comment briefly on the fact, right, that um, if you do look at the case, there are, there's, there's a lot of, I think, careful footwork going on, right, and I, I, some of those remarks have been mentioned. I think that one of them is clearly, it's a, it's a difficult thing to challenge a European act or decision by the Court of Justice before a national court, and the, Europe, the, the, the German court seems to be quite aware of that, and it, it finds admissible the complaints in that regard, as far as I can tell, where it is the actions of the German government and the Bundestag that are being challenged. So not challenging the European Act directly, but challenging the acts of the German government in, in um, performing its duties under both the obligations under EU law, but also the constitutional obligations under the German constitutional law. And that instantly remind, um, reminds us of the other decisions, such as the European arrest warrant that was mentioned, where it was the claim that the, Europe, that the German parliament did not do what it had in its power to enforce to the extent possible the German constitutional safeguards and obligations. Um, so that's the first sort of footwork that is very careful. And, that, and then, of course, the European law, the European Act becomes um, a preliminary question for the discussion of the responsibilities of the German government. So that's, I think that's a, that's a jurisprudential switch, right? The technical delicacy with which the court tries to say this is that we're only dealing with the concern about the actions of the German state authorities, but to get there, we have to, as a preliminary question, actually review the decision of the ECB. Um, and to get there, they have to also do, and this was also mentioned, to, to make another step and to say, when the European Court of Justice, upon our request, actually already ruled on that, it did not do this properly. Um, I think Gonzalo mentioned the, the, the ruthlessness or the um, sort of the, the very severe nature of, of the charge, right? That it was simply arbitrary, incomprehensible and arbitrary. I'm quite reminded and I'm quite sure, I'm not a particular expert on the German constitutional tradition, but I suppose it's not very dissimilar from the Slovenian one, when this is one of the tools given to and demanded of the constitutional court when reviewing the decisions of the ordinary courts. We usually, the Germans have a doctrine we have also adopted, the Schumann formula, you don't question the interpretation of the law given by the ordinary court, but you may question whether such a law enacted by the parliament would be constitutional, and you certainly often fall back on these procedural safeguards that the decisions of the courts must be reasoned. And if they're not reasoned well enough, um, if they don't provide reasons and they're arbitrary, um, then this is a charge leveled at them, right? And, and, and so I, I think in some regards, right, the, um, the, the tool is not unfamiliar. Um, I think even in the domestic terms, it, 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 it is perhaps more critical than should have been the case of, or at least gives a criticism that seems more severe than it should be the case of the ordinary court's um, decisions, but that's what it uses, right? Now, the, the difference here, of course, is that in the classic domestic situation, when you would say the domestic court did not fulfill its obligation to provide a reasoned argumentation, a reasoning that would substantiate its findings, its ruling, its, its, its statement on, on the decision on the decision on the case, you would remand the case back and you would say, do it again. But here we have one of those hurdles where the German court would simply not be able to say, we have asked the court of justice to give us their preliminary ruling. We have received the ruling. We don't like it. Um, we think it's actually ultra virus. It, it does severe damage to the structural. It goes beyond the role of under Article 19. It, it simply just you know, wrecks the competence division. So we don't think it, 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 it holds merit in this case. Now, if it were possible, you might be able to say, do it again, right? Um, the same way that the court indirectly expects the ECB to do it again and to find a 
better justification for the proportionality of the of the of the program in the three months um, coming up. Um, so, so that I think is already part of this careful footwork that the court has to play and tries to play in saying we're going to stay within the jurisdictional limits, we're reviewing the decisions of the German government, and we're taking the, the review of EU law under your advisement solely as a preliminary question. Um, and we need to do this because we don't think that the disposition of the European Court of Justice is actually valid. Right, so, so that's the footwork. And, and actually you can see the footwork as it goes on um, through the judgment, right? So I, I think there, there was a bit of that mentioned already, right? The court often says, and I, I recognize this practice and, and, and I think we all follow this, right? You, you try to see that you're not really breaking new ground so much, right, that much. And, and I think you see this throughout the judgment. Um, we're not saying, we're not treading the new ground, right? So they're saying, you know, they very clearly state the conditions of conducting an ultra-virus review are well established, right? And they quote their cases. They also don't diminish the role of the ECJ in principle, right? The Court of Justice in principle. Um, you might say it sometimes is almost an overkill. I remember a paragraph 126 I wrote down, if you want to look it up, where the German court lists the judgments, the many judgments in which the European court has recognized the requirements of the principle of proportionality. It's a very long paragraph for what perhaps is not such a necessary exposition of the, of the jurisprudence of the, of the European court. So there is a, an element, right, of trying to be um, very precise and methodologically um, sound in that respect. So of course, the outcome, however you, um, in a way, wrap it up, um, is that the German court finds both decisions of the ECB and the decision of the, of the European Court of Justice to be wanting, to be inadequate. And, and ultimately, yes, because it sets its, and I think it shouldn't set it lower than that, right? But even if you set out to set out a threshold of review for the validity of the European Acts, the manifest um, uh, impropriety, the manifest error in law is the lowest you can go. I don't think that it would work if you said we just have a different view and ours should be, um, ours should be dispositive of the case. Um, so the outcome of that, the, the, the sort of the consequences of that are varied, right? And we've talked about them. There are the legal consequences um, I remember one of the reviews said, you know, even when they make this cost benefit analysis, I don't think that they're fair. We're going to perhaps be arguing about this or reviewing this um, in the months to come, where they said the monetary policy on the one hand, with a much sort of extensive list of the um, economic, fiscal, and political um, e effects on the other side, right? So. On the, on the benefit side, you say, well, there's the monetary policy. On the, on the cost side, there's the economic and the fiscal and the um, political um, costs to pay. Um, I think that argument was that, you know, if, if you bring in all those costs, you should also recognize that they themselves contain benefits. So you should contain, you should actually include them. Is it fair to include them only on the side of the costs and not include them? Maybe I think a proportionality review would actually, when they, re when you think about the economic or or fiscal cost, you would actually acknowledge you would already have um, some sort of a balancing exercise there, or at least a weighing exercise of understanding the costs relative to the potential benefits in that regard as well. Um, there's also that element, and it was mentioned before that. You know, they say this does not apply to the pandemic emergency purchase program, but the conditions it seems to be holding as, um, the court seems to be holding as indispensable, drawing on the Gauweiler case, um, do not apply to the PEPP, right? The pandemic emergency. So I, I think that all those concerns, how will this play out are quite um, valid. Um, there are also, of course, political consequences. I think there's an interesting, and Matthias mentioned this very nicely, the tug of war between the European court, um, well, the European institutions and the German court um, that will follow, right, the, 
this debate. It has already actually been going on during the, um, the, the proceedings because the ECB has um, refused or not selected to appear in a hearing. I think if I understand from the judgment, it was invited. The judgment makes a, a point of the fact that the ECB did not appear. Um, I'm reminded we had a case some time ago where the ECB actually lodged a constitutional complaint as a complainant before our court in Slovenia, um, arguing that a decision of a Slovenian court, um, it was to deal with whether or not seizing documents in, term, in the context of a criminal interdiction, which are the documents held by the national central banks, but there are electronic copies of documents that pertain to the ECB whether these documents fall under the protection of the archives of the union. And when the national court disposed of the issue um, and said it's clearly not, the ECB lodged a constitutional complaint. And it was for our court to decide not before we could come to the merits, because on the merits we could easily have discussed, we didn't come to that point, that perhaps the national court really was wrong not to make a preliminary reference, because it clearly was not a issue already disposed of by the ECJ. But the issue for us was, can the ECB claiming, and, it, and we also found it was actually acting ex jure imperi as an institution of the union, can the ECB invoke the protection of the right, of a fundamental right under the char charter of fundamental rights? Was it really intended to give the European institutions rights that they can invoke before national courts? And we found that as a matter of domestic law, um, it could not actually lodge a constitutional complaint in that particular instance. Um, I wonder if the ECB now would, would, would think that, you know, there are, again, also costs and benefits to um, becoming engaged in this sort of national jurisdiction. It certainly will have that tug of war where it cannot simply, as Matthias said, I think it will be difficult to say, we're going to acknowledge the judgment, so here are the reasons you want it, right? So how to find a way within the next few months of getting the reasons which will satisfy, which will at least allow the German government, right? Because it's the addressee of the decision to come before the court if needed and say, look, you know, your conditions have been met, right? So there is no longer a need to impose those sort of um, decisions. So those, those sort of things will have. I think one of the, them, and I'm slowly coming to the end as well to allow a bit more time for the discussion of, um, this uh, to some some Q and A period, it will be that of course it in a way it's up to us it's up to everybody including the Court of Justice including the German Court itself when when the aftermath is played out whether we see this as a serious challenge to the constitutional pluralism right whether on the one hand it's a challenge again of that you know delicate interplay between the different constitutional orders and the EU law uh, which was a reflection also are reflected in the Zolange Saga, right? The, the fact that we all have the same principles which have been recognized often drawing on the constitutional traditions as general principles of EU law, but which have distinctions in the way that the different states is, you know, understand them, right? We're not united you know, out of many one as Benfica or the United States, we are united in diversity. So. Um, how does this play out um, is perhaps again right brought to challenge because one of the big elements in which Zolange Tsui was seen as a good departure from Zolange One was to understand that it's going to be some, sometimes slightly different that a particular principle will be understood and applied at the EU level, right? So the more you impose, the more you think of this decision as focusing on the German interests vis-a-vis -vis the European interests the more you see it as being concerned with them as opposed to us, right? Um, it becomes problematic in that nature. And of course, it's, we've, we've been used to judicial dialogues, right? Where courts would, in their own way, conduct a dialogue. And sometimes this would imply a disagreement with each other. So you would have those sort of decisions. But now the court of the German court is going beyond the judicial dialogue because it says, because we are not satisfied with the, with the court's pronouncements, we're actually directly going to engage with the ECB, with the other institutions. So I think that in that regard, um, there are going to be, I think, diffi di di difficult sort of um, 
challenges ahead to, to sort of figure out how we can actually sort of maintain, which I'm sure the German court wanted to, right? Maintain the overall integrity and respect for the rule of law. And, and it certainly didn't think of it. I'm sure they were aware of the bang it would cost, but I, I'm also sure that they thought they could manage to do what they thought was needed um, in terms of deciding the case without doing damage to the rule of law, to the respect for the judiciary and so forth in the European Union. Um, now, how it's going to work out I, I, I is left to see. Um, I think that inevitably there are going to be, of course, those who invoke the judgment as an example of the overreach of the aggrandizement of the EU at the expense of the member states um, in different member states around Europe, not necessarily just those that are mentioned. I think that um, Poland and Hungary are examples, but not necessarily exceptions of, of um, the difficulties for the rule of law and independence of judiciary and so forth. Um, now, how it plays out will, of course, also depend on the, on the national, the robustness of the national structures, right, and the national systems. Um, I'm quite sure that we may see a departure. I mean, this was quite a strong statement. I think the vote was 7-1. It was not a divided court. Um, but, but we are, I think, also going to see decisions coming out of Karlsruhe that are not going to be as um, belligerent as this one appears to be from the point of view of an EU lawyer. So um, maybe I stop here and allow more time for discussion. Thank you all, and I look forward to the questions. Now, Luis, Luis Fabrica. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, three very interesting uh, uh, opinions about uh, what uh, happened uh, and what uh, what may 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 uh, be the result of this uh, very important, I think, decision of the German Constitutional Court. And since we don't have uh, too much time, I will uh, put uh, three questions at once each for each one of us. And then a fourth question, which is for all, uh, all of you, and it's a quite open question. So you can, you can basically say what you want to say about the fourth question. Uh, but this uh, first uh, set of three questions. Matthias, is it possible that new cases may emerge in Germany against any future ECB's program? Uh, question its economic effects meaning that this, this decision could be the first of a, uh, several other decisions, more or less with the same uh, um, goals. Second uh, uh, question uh, to, to Gonzalo, uh, what will be the consequences, what could be the consequences of this decision for, for the Southern Europe countries' proposals uh, of mutualization of the public debts? And should the, the recent Merkel-Macron initiative be regarded in some way as a response to the, to, to the doubts and fears that were raised by the, by the German Constitutional Court decision? And uh, third, uh, Matthew, uh, may this uh, decision, may this judgment be regarded as some kind of a mutiny against the unofficial dogma of the infallibility of the European Court of Justice. Could this state of mind explain the unusual aggressive tone of the judgment judgment? Is it correct to say that the judgment constitutional court was only verbalizing in a harsh Teutonic manner the reserves that are shared by other constitutional courts against the ECG jurisprudence? And that's, for now, that's it. Thank you. Perhaps, Matthias, could you begin? There was a fourth question you wanted to ask all of us. The fourth question I was reserving for later, but I, I can tell it now. It's more or less the following. Um, uh, Winston Churchill used to say that uh, most of the times nothing happens. 
lots of commentaries, lots of multitude of events, but most of the times nothing really happens. Uh, uh, but sometimes uh, things happen. And my, my, my question, what should, what could really, is this a, a storm in a cup of tea? Or is this a really a, a fundamental moment in the history of Europe, saying that uh, perhaps we are going to dismantle the, your, uh, the uh, not only not all the, the, the uh, economic, uh, the monetary uh, union, but also the the, the 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 very fundamentals of European Union, uh, or or. Uh, on the opposite view, we are just in the verge of a fundamental institutional change that, that could lead us for uh, 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 more integration. So uh, are we in fact at the crossroads and where very important decisions have to be taken? Or is this just a, a, a skeptical British uh, uh, politician would say, uh, a storm in a cup of tea? This is the fourth question for everyone at first, but for the, then uh, you could answer this. The first one was, uh, if, if you could expect uh, some uh, new cases uh, against any uh, ECB program. Yes, the two are of course very closely connected because here are two possible ways this could evolve. The first is that very soon um, after, the, the, the challenge will be made against the, the most recent program uh, of further quantitative easing. Uh, decided in the context of the coronavirus, because there were a whole host of specific conditions uh, which apply to that program, which if you read literally uh, the decision of the German Constitutional Court and you think that they'll follow through on this, uh, they would have to declare unconstitutional in violation with the eternity clause in Germany, constitutional identity, etc. So fundamentally, um, uh, we could be in a situation that I think Gonzalo's analysis quite correctly described where the German Constitutional Court is effectively saying the European Central Bank, which is currently functioning like an ordinary central bank of a, of a, of a sovereign state, it's functioning like the Fed, it's functioning like the, um, uh, like, like, the, um, like the Japanese Central Bank or like the Bank of England, um, it's doing that kind of thing. But the point is, so the German Constitutional Court might insist or certainly insisting in this judgment, it might say, no, no, but you know, the ECB is supposed to play a more limited role. It is more distinctly and more limitedly focused only on the monetary aspects and not this kind of potpourri of, um, of instruments, which always also have a monetary significance, but often uh, have a primary focus on fiscal and economic policies. So for example, so when Trump tells the Fed uh, uh, limit, you know, go, reduce your interest rates, then he's doing, he's basically telling them to take a measure which has a very distinctive economic, as part of an economic policy. It's supposed to lead to a flourishing of the economy to greater employment and therefore increases electoral chances in November. So it's understood that banks uh, have within their ordinary tool bag uh, measures which have great implications for fiscal and economic policies. And what the German Bank, uh, what the German Constitution Court is saying, that may be the case for other central banks, but with regard to the foundation of the European Union's texts, the ECB is to play a more limited role. And if we take that judgment seriously in all its details and all the legalistic conditions that it establishes, then it would effectively mean that the European Central Bank cannot do very many things that since that it has been doing ever since Draghi said, whatever it takes. And if that's true, if the, if the German Constitutional Court will uphold this legislation and this direction, um, then the kind of choices that uh, Gonzalo mentioned uh, are indeed the choices um, that uh, we would face. So it would mean either uh, moving beyond the status quo on the, on the European Union and changing the treaties, uh, both with regard to the European Central Bank or perhaps also with regard to fiscal and economic policies. And, uh, uh, and indeed, I, it's, I, see it, I see the actions taken by Macron and, uh, and Merkel as moving in the direction, not necessarily of a federation, but at least of, uh, in terms of a change of treaties. This will lead to a change. It might very well lead into change of very limited, in very certain, certain articles will be changed. That's, that has happened before. It happened recently in the financial crisis. Uh, it could happen again. Uh, but limited treaty change to allow for a, a, a more 
uh, independent European role uh, in fiscal and economic for fiscal and economic policies, and it might also then include um, the European Central Bank. But for that, a treaty change would be necessary, and that's a very you know we have no idea whether this will effectively go through against uh, we'll get a consensus on this. Um, but that's that would be needed if we don't have that. If, so if the Euro, if the German Central Bank is serious about uh, if the German Constitutional Court is serious about its judge its doctrinal structure, it wants to follow through on it. And there will be other cases where it would then strike down uh, various measures. Then that would be one way out. Um, so ex ex changing the treaties, expanding the possibilities for European actions. But if that's somehow not possible, if that's not going to happen, then uh, then there is no way in which the monetary union uh, can be uh, upheld realistically over time, uh, I think. Uh, so um, the court has, uh, if we take it, if, if we have deep belief in a legal doctrine and courts and legalism, uh, then we might look at what has happened here as a, as a, as a major event, um, one that forces decisions and political actions in uh, quite different, potentially radical directions. Um, and we're facing a real drama. However, uh, my view on this is uh, that the German Constitutional Court um, uh, will simply step back uh, because it, it was itself shocked uh, by the very severe headwinds uh, that it faced after it handed down the judgment. It had very little support by the German government, um, uh, uh, only very limited parts uh, in the CDU supported uh, the judgment. The dominant view within the party was this is not what the court should be doing. And without, without support of any of the governing parties or the main opposition parties, except of course the radical right, which currently is not exactly the support that you want if you're in the constitutional court, um, and no one is supporting the court. And a court in that type of political situation, uh, here's my uh, uh, will is more likely to step back um, uh, and uh, let things pass and subtly change its doctrine. Um, uh, whether it will, that's, that shift will be, how that, how that will happen, um, uh, whether it will be an explicit change of doctrine or whether it will take the form of, of using the same type of doctrinal structure, uh, but simply saying that now the court feels that there was, this, this was not, no longer arbitrary. Uh, you know, some, some way like that, the court is likely to accommodate. And if that's going to happen, um, as I think it will, uh, then there won't be many cases of this kind and there won't be much of a crisis. So it depends on how much uh, faith uh, you have in the legalism, the doctrinal structure and the institution of a national constitutional court. In this case, um, I think for, uh, for reasons that politically we have good reasons to be happy about, um, my faith in this constitutional court with regard to these types of decisions is limited. Thank you very much. Crystal clear. Gonzalo, is the mutualization over and uh, what's next? I have, I have no idea. Um, if there is a science of making political predictions, I, I haven't mastered it. If it's a matter of educated guesses, I am uneducated. And in any case, even if, if I had anything to say about that, um, in my capacity as a constitutional judge, I really should confine my remarks to the realm of the legal and constitutional. And, and that's exactly why I have to say I don't disagree with what um, Matthias just said. So when I um, articulated that relatively catastrophic scenario of options, I was carrying out to the extreme the legal and constitutional analysis. But of course, it's entirely possible that this judgment, also considering the circumstances of this judgment, that you know the president of the German Constitutional Court stepped down a day later, um, that everyone seems to be extremely critical of the judgment. Courts are not primarily political actors, but they are, of course, influenced by the surrounding political context. There's a famous book uh, written by an American constitutional lawyer of the mid 20th century um, called The Least Dangerous Branch, which describes the passive virtues of judging. Um, obviously, constitutional courts are um, um, 
in, to some extent political actors as well. All of these may have an enormous influence on the fate of this decision. But if you do um, carry um, the premises to their logical conclusions, then this is, um, this is a bomb. Um, it's, a, it's a massive bomb. And I have to say, I mean, the, the German constitutional court is an extremely consistent. You, can, you cannot charge, for the most part, the, the German constitutional court for being um, an institution, judicial institution that is um, um, supportive of ad hoc or, um, uh, let's say, poorly uh, constructed judgments. And, and you can see that in this decision. I mean, they, they, they've taken uh, premises that have been slowly established over the course of 25 years, and they have drawn the, um, the implications. Uh, whether or not that will be the case here, I have no clue. And what the political actors, non-judicial actors will do about it, I have no idea. It's clear that something will happen. I mean, the, as Matthias is very clear about this. I, this for me is obvious that uh, there is no future for the, you're, this is the only quasi political analysis statement that I will make. You cannot have a common currency if you don't have at least a strong central bank and probably quite a bit more than that. And it's obvious to me that there is no such thing as monetary and fiscal policy as in fiscal is a real economy and monetary is about monetary policy. That's absurd. That when Matei mentioned something, and it's true, I've seen people who say the court didn't really only consider the costs, the economic costs, not the benefits. But the point is that monetary policy is an instrument to influence the economy. So um, the, the costs and benefits, which is something the court actually does not get into because it considers that to be, um, uh, that would be second guessing the policy itself. But the, um, the, the, of, of course, monetary policy pursues um, economic goals. Uh, there is no doubt about that. And it's extremely difficult to draw a clear line between the monetary and the economic when we're talking about effects. It's very clear if you're talking about actions. As I said, raising taxes is not monetary policy. But if you want to talk about the effects of conventional monetary policy measures, then it becomes really hard. And I do not see how that could be the basis for um, separating the competence of the union and the competence of the member states. And I most certainly do not believe that that separation would in any way serve the future of the Eurozone. So something is bound to happen. What will happen, what shape will take is something that is beyond my comprehension. Thank you very much, uh, Gonzalo. And now, uh, Matthew, uh, are just uh, the German judges verbalizing the revolt against the dogma of infallibility of the uh, European Court of Justice? Uh, does it explain the, the, the aggressive tone of the of judgment? Uh, do you think that uh, the, uh, the same uh, pattern will be followed by other uh, constitutional courts all over Europe. What's your idea? Yeah, thank you very much. I think you, before you said, is this a mutiny, right? And it was a, an evocative term. It's 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 an interesting term. I I think it certainly was not sold as a mutiny, right? It was not intended, perhaps, as a mutiny in general. Um, it was certainly a disagreement and a very strong, and like you said, you know, um, strongly worded, strongly reasoned legal di judicial disagreement with the particular actions of the ECB and the review of the Court of Justice in this particular instance. I think if you ask, I, I, I again, we, we can't speculate too much, but I think if you ask the German judges whether they intended this to be a mutiny, they would say, no, we, we absolutely reaffirm the importance of the Court of Justice as the arbiter of EU law. I think the judgment, it's a long judgment, includes a number of passages that try to also convey that element. Um, but of course, in this particular instance, they find the decision to be wanting. And uh, so in that regard, um, it's a very strong statement of a disagreement. They may consider it to be an element of judicial dialogue being taken to um, perhaps a little bit more extreme version of that. Uh, but you're absolutely right that, of course, when people read the judgment, when they see what was being done, 
um, and decide that they will, of course, read into it what message they find to be the most sort of persuasive one, or especially if they agree with certain criticisms, they might read into them a broader uh, message as well. And um, I don't think that they're necessarily verbalizing concerns of other courts or apex courts or constitutional courts, but certainly certain elements of the national um, legal and political communities. And um, I, it will be interesting to see how, if these sort of nightmare scenarios actually come about, how this may play out when people are going to invoke this decision as an argument in favor of um, rebelling against other decisions of the ECJ, or indeed um, following, fulfilling the obligations under EU law. Um, I don't think necessarily um, it will lead to this. Um, I, I, I do think that a lot of the courts, and I, I think this is an element where the judicial community in Europe generally tries to find the right um, approach to conducting judicial dialogue. I think all of the courts around Europe would be concerned if the European Court of Justice considered the, Europe, the judicial dialogue to be a one-way street, right? To be the, the, the communication of the sort where the European Court of Justice hands down the authoritative pronouncements on EU law and the national courts obediently follow them. Um, I think there are elements in which you try to make changes, including to the way in which the European court itself treats the preliminary references. I think in this particular instance, the German court probably was also dissatisfied with the way that its own views um, were being taken into account by the European Court of Justice. And I think there's this debate to be had, certainly at the level of the courts. I, I would hesitate to imagine that the courts, the apex courts, would see this as an opportunity to, to in a way, um, perhaps question the authority of the judicial pronouncements of the ECJ more generally. Um, I, I think it will also be counterproductive for their own positions as the arbiters of national systems to, 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 to engage in this too lightheartedly. Um, so I, I, I would imagine and I would hope that this would not be the sort of an automatic reaction to this decision or the way they understand it. But whether or not it's really significant what it means, right? And is it a storm in a keep up or, or a stick up or, or some important significant crossroads? I think we have always seen, and I, I remember I was, uh, when I was researching the European integration project, you could easily make a claim that the European Union has always grown through the crisis most, if not, if not only through the crisis, but so certainly it has transformed itself most at the times of the different crises. It was born out of a very profound crisis which changed the impetus, which actually in a way pushed the countries, Vorey, non Vorey, a combination of the two, to subscribe to a system of common sets of values with a judicial control of a supranational judicial authority and so forth. Um, it has perhaps been bolstered to reimagine or deepen the idea of its own constitutional identity when faced with the challenge of um, an undefined number of East European states trying to seeing the um, perspective of accession in the 90s, um, which forced the European Union to, to start developing these fundamental principles and now values that Gonzalo mentioned before. And the financial crisis even, you know, 10 years ago was seen as an impetus to think about whether actually the problem of the inadequate response of the European Union was the inadequate competences so that there was a need for the fiscal union for the banking union. You may remember the presidents of the institutions got together and said there are three further steps to be taken to fully integrate and um, complete the economic and monetary union. Although in the Treaty of Maastricht, they've actually set out the three steps which have concluded 10 years or even less than 10 years later. Um, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm quite certain that it, in, I wouldn't be surprised if there's a new treaty revision. If you think about it, it's now almost 13 years since the Treaty of Lisbon was drafted and agreed upon. By the way, Portugal is soon to be presiding again. So if it happens in the next year, we might be talking of the Treaty of Lisbon part two. Um, but you know, more importantly, if it does happen in 21, and it's, it would be quite rapid in a way if it did, right? Um, 
I'm rooting it happens in the second half because Slovenia is presiding in the second half. We are right after Portugal. Um, it will be practically as much time that has passed since the last treaty revision that has also passed between the Treaty of Maastricht and the Treaty of Lisbon, which included also the Treaty of Amsterdam, the Treaty of Nice and the failed constitutional treaty. So it used to be the case that the European Union engaged in this constitutional uh, refurbishment or transformations much more often than it does now. Um, and maybe despite all the crisis, partly the crisis were responsible for that, but maybe it will be now the time to do it again. And, and then it will not be because of this particular decision, but it will certainly be because of all the engagement that it encourages and, and adds to, that we may reopen the discussions of what further steps of integration we might wish to undertake. And then maybe in the textbooks 15 years from now, people are going to say, this was one of those pivotal moments. We will not really know for sure. I also don't think it's that dramatic on its own face in the long-term scenarios, but, but we'll see what happens and maybe it does contribute to something new coming out of it. Well, thank you very much, please. I, yeah, I, I think we, we exceeded already our, our time. So I, I have to thank the speakers for enlightening us on, on, on these important topics. I believe that many more questions remain to be asked, but we have now to close this, this session. So we will invite uh, those who are now attending to also visit the website of Fabio Advogados. And uh, we thank you very much for being with us. We remain available and invite you to attend the next webinar and information sessions at abrudvogados.com. The recording of this session will also be available shortly. So we will send all of you the link and it will be shared also at our LinkedIn page. So thank you very much and see you soon.